Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father, through our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is our epistle reading from 1 Peter chapter 2, which includes these words. If when you do a good, if when you do good and suffer for it you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. This is the word of our Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, I'm sure not all of you are familiar with the world of Harry Potter. Some of you, I'm sure, are. Probably more familiar than I am. So if I get something wrong, have mercy on my soul, okay? But the world of Harry Potter is populated by powerful wizards, some good, some evil. It's also populated by fantastic beasts, and mythical creatures. Now, one of those mythical creatures is a little fellow named Dobby, and Dobby is a house elf. House elves are attached to a family, and they cannot break that attachment no matter how badly they are treated. Now, some house elves are treated very well. Dobby, however, was not. He was attached to the house of Malfoy led by Lucius Malfoy, who was a bad dude. We see in the movie, for example, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, that Dobby is abused, misused, mistreated, and yet he has to remain attached to that house. Well, it's at the end of that movie, however, that Harry Potter intervenes. You see, a house elf can be liberated if his master gives him a piece of clothing. Well, in one of the closing scenes of that movie, Dobby and Harry Potter are confronted by Lucius Malfoy. And Lucius tells Dobby he has to come with him. But before doing that, Harry Potter hands Lucius a book to look at, and he just kind of hands it right back to Dobby. What Malfoy didn't know was that Harry Potter had taken one of his own socks and tucked it into that book. And when Lucius Malfoy hands that book to Dobby, he is giving him a piece of clothing. Dobby becomes a free elf, no longer attached to the evil house of Malfoy. Our hearts glow when Dobby says, Master has given Dobby a sock because now Dobby is free, free from his slavery. Now that warms our hearts and it seems very much in line with, with our view of the world. But quite honestly, while it is very heartwarming, it is not thoroughly biblical. Now, there's nothing wrong with the slave being set free. But we have to come to terms with what the Bible says about the institution of slavery. For example, our passage today from 1 Peter 2, the text that I read earlier from the lectern, makes it sound like it's being addressed to Christians in general who are suffering some sort of unjust treatment, whether it be persecution, ridicule, whatever it might be. And Peter is encouraging us to endure that. But the verse preceding our text tells us that Peter isn't talking to Christians in general. He is talking to slaves. Slaves, he writes, submit yourselves to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. This is a tough passage for us, isn't it? In fact, when we read the Bible, 
regarding slavery, we come to a startling conclusion. Nowhere in the Bible does anybody speak against the institution of slavery. Slavery was a common practice in the ancient world, and the Bible recognizes that. Abraham, the father of all those who have the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, Abraham had slaves. His son, or grandson, Jacob, had slaves. Jacob's favored son, Joseph, was sold into slavery by his brothers, no less. And when Jacob's family was invited by Joseph, who through God's providence had become prime minister of Egypt, when Jacob's family is invited to move to Egypt, they come as welcomed guests. But in a matter of generations, they become slaves. So God's people had a history of slavery, both being slaves and slave owners. What about the New Testament? Jesus never speaks against the institution of slavery. Paul never speaks against the institution of slavery. In fact, Paul had the golden opportunity to do so. We have the letter to Philemon, a personal letter that Paul wrote to a friend of his about a runaway slave named Onesimus. Now, Paul does encourage Philemon to take Onesimus back, and he promises that he would pay for any damages that Onesimus might have caused by being a runaway slave. But nowhere does Paul urge Onesimus, even though he has become a Christian, nowhere does Paul urge that Onesimus be freed by Philemon. Some people have a difficult time with the fact that, at least on the surface, the Bible considers slavery to be an all right institution. But although the scriptures do not speak directly regarding the institution of slavery, we do have biblical teachings that would eventually lead to abolition of slavery in our nation and in others. After all, when Jesus teaches us to love your neighbor as yourself, and when you realize that every human being is a neighbor, and I'm supposed to love them as I love myself, how do I treat them as property? When Jesus says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, how can I own another human being and treat them as property. So although the scriptures do not speak against slavery, the biblical teachings about love undermine the institution of slavery. And we saw that happen in our nation. We fought a bitter war in order to address the issue of slavery in our nation. So we recognize that, yes, in the ancient world, and quite honestly in the not-so-ancient world, in the, in the world today, slavery exists in the form of, of forced labor trafficking and sex trafficking. Slavery exists to this very day. Peter is addressing first century slaves. But we can broaden out what he says to include Christians in general. And the words that he speaks to slaves also are spoken to us. He says, it is a good, gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrow while suffering unjustly. What credit is it, is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure? 
This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Again, these are hard words even when we apply them in general to our lives as Christians because unjust suffering seems so unfair. How can God's word encourage us to endure that when we ought to be fighting against it? Some would say. The Bible teaches us to endure unjust suffering. But the Bible does not tell us that we should not try to work against it. You see, we are called to be salt and light in this world. To bring the light of God's love and mercy into dark places where there is injustice. We are called to be like the yeast that affects the whole lump of dough. That's our calling as followers of Jesus Christ. Think back to our history as Lutherans. Martin Luther did not seek to overturn the Roman Catholic Church. He did not seek to separate from the Roman Catholic Church. What do we call the movement that he started? The Reformation Movement. He sought to reform the church from within by bringing it back to the truth of God's word that we are not saved because of our works, but rather we are saved completely and freely by the grace of God. It was only when the Roman Catholic Church excommunicated him that we have the founding of what we call today the Lutheran Church. We are always called to be about the work of reformation in our culture. And so when we see injustice, we are called to speak against it when we experience injustice. We are called to endure. If when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, Peter says. Not because Christians are supposed to be masochists and haters of self. No, if I'm going to love my neighbor, Jesus also says, love yourself. But there are times when we are experiencing unjust suffering, and, and that becomes part of our calling. And why? Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. We're all familiar, I'm sure, with that poem or that story, Footprints in the Sand. You know how that one goes, right? A man is talking to Jesus and kind of looking at the, the path of his life, and, and he often sees two sets of footprints, his and Jesus. But there are times in his life, he says, Jesus, that was a really difficult time. How come there's only one set of footprints there? Weren't you with me? To which Jesus replies, those are the times that I carried you. Quite honestly, if Peter had been writing footprints in the sand, when the person comes to Jesus and says, those were the difficult times in my life, how come there's only one set of footprints? Jesus' answer would not have been, because those are the times I carried you. He would have said, those are the times that you were walking in my footsteps. If we want to talk about unjust suffering, we need to look no farther than our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ also suffered for you, 
leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin. Peter here begins to borrow language and phrasing and imagery from Isaiah 53, which talks about the suffering servant of the Lord. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. That's the example that has been set before us. When we are experiencing unjust suffering in whatever form it may take, we have fellow brothers and sisters in Christ around the world who are persecuted because of their faith. They are imprisoned, they are beaten, they are tortured because of their faith. They are suffering unjustly. Peter would say to them, entrust yourself to him who judges justly. When we experience unjust treatment at the hands of others, although it goes against our nature and it strikes us as so deeply unfair, Peter would say to each one of us, continue to entrust yourself to him who judges justly. That is not hard to do, or that is not easy to do. It is very hard to do. It was hard for Jesus to do as well. But he did it for you. Peter goes on to say, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. He went to the cross for you and me. He suffered unjustly at the hands of his enemies that he might bear our sins in his body to the cross of Calvary where he willingly gave up his life. Our friend Dobby's story doesn't end with him simply becoming a free elf. In subsequent stories, we find out how deeply he befriends Harry Potter, who, when he had set Dobby free with that little sock in the book trick, Harry made Dobby Promise something. Promise you will never try to save my life again. Well, Dobby would break that promise. Harry and his friends, Ron and Hermione, have been taken captive by another evil person, Bellatrix Lestrange, who practices the dark arts. Dobby sneaks into the room where they are being held. He causes a chandelier to fall, separating Bellatrix from Harry and his friends, which allows them to open a portal, a mystical portal that they can go through. And Harry, his friends, and Dobby go through that portal. But before it closes, Bellatrix throws her silver dagger. which also goes into the portal. On the other side of the portal, Harry and his friends find themselves on a beach, safe and unharmed. And then you hear the voice of Dobby calling out to his friend Harry Potter. The silver dagger that had been intended to kill Harry has impaled Dobby in the chest. And with Harry's name on his lips, Dobby dies. With your name on his lips, Jesus died for you. He took the punishment and death that we richly deserve because he bore our sins in his body to the tree. He gave us an example of unjust suffering, of entrusting himself 
to the one who judges justly. And we remember those dying words of Jesus, right? Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. My friends, when you are going through those times of unjust suffering because of others, remember your Lord Jesus. Remember how he suffered for you so that you might be redeemed so that you might be spared the punishment of God that you deserved. Jesus in love endured unjust suffering for you. And remember his words that he spoke as he was dying and make those your words as well as you entrust yourself to the one who judges justly. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Amen. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. <laughs>